You might think a BMW is a good car to buy. Yes, they are packed full of modern technology, but that's the reason I tell people not to buy these BMWs. Because under the hood are layers and layers of technology. And as you can see, the hood struts don't even work anymore. Those are broken. <laughs> so we'll get our plastic stick out. Yeah. Old technology for new technology. <laughs> Let's take this BMW as an example, and a pretty much a sterling example of the high technology and the problems they have. This is a 2008 335i. It has all the bells and whistles. It's a straight six cylinder engine, but it puts out 300 horsepower using technology. It's an inline six, kind of an old design. It has two turbochargers on it to make it have power. And if they go bad, and bad they do, the turbochargers are over $3,000 a piece, over $2,000 labor, so you're looking at over eight grand if they go bad. Now, the original owner of this car paid $45,000 up for this thing. And my customer bought it for $13.5 and it had like 40,000 miles on it. So you think, oh, what a deal. Well, the price alone tells you it's not a deal. Before he met me, he said, Scotty, I thought I was getting a deal, but then every time I take it in, it's $1,000 for this, $2,000 for that. Now, yes, they are maintenance heavy vehicles. They cost a lot of money to maintain. Anybody who actually knows how to work on these has to have some extremely sophisticated equipment that costs a ton of money. And as far as I'm concerned, a lot of it has to do with the overuse of plastics in these things. One of the first companies to use plastic for just about everything. With these BMWs, it doesn't matter the mileage, age destroys the plastics. Heat of the engine under the hood, the stuff cracks and comes apart. If you ever have to work on one of these when it gets to be older, this one's 12 years old now, you got to be really careful working around the engine because you can easily start snapping off plastic parts. They're so brittle. And then when you find these little plastic parts cost 300, 500, some of them well over a thousand dollars when you include labor because you got to take half the car apart to get to them. These things are notorious for getting oil leaks around the oil filter. You might think, oh, no big deal. They're just gaskets in there. Well, some of these things, it's over a thousand dollars labor taking all the crap off to get to the stupid gasket. Now, in the case of this particular one, it's here because it's not shifting right. Now, I have equipment for this stuff, and as you can see, we're now in the transmission. You can check variables, shifting, you can check solenoids, you can see what the adaptation values are, even find all the code numbers so you can look it up if perhaps there's a recall for your particular vehicle. Most guys that have this equipment, they're paying a ton for the stuff, you're gonna pay a ton to have your car worked on. And a lot of guys won't even touch it. And they'll say, take it to the dealer. And you know what they charge at the dealer. Now, in this case, I did a lot of testing. Drove it around. So as you can see, there's a lot of data that needs to be looked at while the car's being driven. I was able to do a bunch of actuation tests to see if the solenoid valves are working right and what kind of data's in it. And unfortunately, in the case of this one, there were no error codes for the transmission. The data was all relatively normal. So I thought, well, I know how these things are. I took a sample of the transmission fluid. Now, it's a sealed transmission, so even that was a pain in the butt. There's no dipstick. I had to go under or open up some stuff and take a sample. And I took it to a good friend of mine who analyzes oil. She said that there was too much metal in the oil meaning parts of the transmission were starting to wear out. It hasn't yet tripped any codes, and the adaptations so far are normal for a 12-year-old BMW, but this tells me transmission's starting to wear out. Oil analysis is a great tool for seeing what kind of a shape a vehicle is in, both engine, transmission, differential, whatever. When it's analyzed by somebody who knows what they're talking about, they're gonna find it out, and you can know ahead of time. It's a good predictor. So in this case, the occasional miss shift and stuff, hey, that's a sign of internal wear. When I checked those solenoids driving around, we'd activate them. They were all working and there weren't any codes for any of them going bad. It's starting to wear out. Now for this particular one's 12 years old, BMW offers what they call a fully remanufactured factory transmission. It's about $6,500. And with labor, at least at the BMW dealer, that's pretty close to what the two turbos cost to go. 7,000 something dollars. You buy a beautiful looking car like this used, you are playing with dynamite. You never know what's gonna blow and when it's gonna go. Yes, the Germans put an interesting technology. These lower profile tires, they really handle well, but 
beam lower profile. Guess what? In the city, these things are destroyed. The rims get destroyed. All that stuff costs a small fortune when it goes out. No, that technology is fine at the racetrack because racetracks are pretty smooth. <laughs> they go really fast. They make them well. They're smooth. They don't have giant potholes in them, curbs that you're going to smash into. And this particular model being a beautiful convertible, there are convertible modes. There's a module for the convertible top. Fault codes. You can even read the data stream of the convertible system. We are talking uber, uber, rocket science technology even on a convertible top system for this thing. Now maybe you just love the technology of one of these things. If you really love it and have to have it, take Scotty's advice. Lease one. Don't buy it. If you feel you can afford the lease payments, you're not going to have to repair the thing. You don't have to worry about all that stuff. Something breaks. They generally don't break that fast. If you look at their insanely low resale value, I mean this thing was well over $40,000 new and when it had 40,000 miles it went for 13.5. There's a reason behind that low resale value and if you would have bought it new and then sold it to somebody with 40,000 miles and lost 30 something thousand dollars on the deal, you'd have wished, hey I should have leased that thing, I shouldn't have bought it. Now I do have to say I have customers with BMWs that are totally happy with the cars but most of them are doctors lawyers. They lease the vehicle under a business scenario where it's pre-tax money so they don't have to pay tax on some of their salary or the business itself is leasing it and they're getting the car for free. What do they care? One, their doctors and lawyers have tons of money and two, it's a business write-off. But if you're counting your pennies and you're thinking about buying one of these things used, my advice is just keep saying to yourself, endless money pit, endless money pit, endless money pit. I had a mechanic friend years ago, met at an auto parts store one day and he said, hey look at this great deal I got on this BMW for one of my customers. He didn't want me to fix it anymore so he sold it to me at a really good price. Well, the problem with my friend there was he mainly worked on American cars. He didn't know that much about BMWs. I saw him about a year later and I said, how's that BMW working out for you? He said, that plastic piece of crap, I got rid of it last month. I couldn't stand it anymore. All the plastic stuff kept breaking, the parts cost a fortune. I'll never buy another one of those. And this is a mechanic. Granted, he worked mainly on American cars. He liked the look at a BMW convertible and thought, oh, what a cool car. But in the long run, not so cool. And if you're thinking about getting a diesel BMW here in the United States, realize hardly anybody knows how to work on the things. And of course the parts cost a small fortune, but they are probably the most complex diesel systems out there. When I get them in here, invariably, after I scan it, tell the customer, well here's what we're going to start with. They say, ah, I'm just going to get rid of the thing. I'm sick of this car anyways. Now yes, they are beautiful cars, but sometimes beauty can be deceiving. So unless you like expensive aggravating cars as they age, my advice, stay away from BMWs. Here we got a 12 year old BMW that isn't running right. No surprise there, it's running like crap. Check engine lights on, so let's scan it. The um, scanner up to the data port and what does it say? PO306. Cylinder number six misfire detected. Now a misfire in any one cylinder can be a whole bunch of things. It can be the ignition system, the fuel system, a blowing head gasket, a bad valve, all kinds of stuff. But all we start basically. We're gonna go to number six and see what's going on there. Now being a BMW you can't see the spark plug so we gotta take this plastic crap off. In this case it's a five millimeter hex head. We'll take these stupid things off. Oh it makes them look so great doesn't it? It just makes it a pain to work on. Plain stupidity some of these designs. You gotta take half of this stuff apart to access it to get it off. Another brilliant German design. So we'll take these clips off. Come on over here. Get this out of the way. Then we can slide the cover up and get to the spark plugs up here. And the number six is hiding way back here. So we'll check that first. And now you can see why I think so little of BMWs, modern ones. Look, all plastic crap. This is all plastic crap. You gotta pull the little line off the coil and then it's theoretically just pulls out. But these are stuck because they're 12 years old and they're gonna be cows to get out. Plastic, old age, heat on the engine. And then the stupid cover on top of it to hold the heat in even more so the plastic retains the heat and cracks even more. 
Let's hope nothing breaks when we take it out, but don't be surprised if a bunch of this plastic crap starts snapping off in your hands. You'll just have to replace it then. You gotta pull the coils up. Not an easy thing to do. It's all plastic and it may crack and you're just gonna have to buy a new ignition coil if it does. My trick is to get a big pry bar, start to pry them out. Cause they're sitting in there. There's no bolt holding them in like a better made Toyota where the coils are bolted on. These are just placed in, but that rubber and plastic Hey, it's been on there for 12 years, so it's often really hard to get off, and you'll often break stuff, but here goes nothing. We try some frying and praying. Praying and frying. <laughs> Getting a little looser. Still won't come out, though. Now, it is easy to work on the front one, so I got the front one out, and there's a point to this. If I ever do get the back number six one off, without breaking it. What I'm gonna do is check the spark plug, see if the spark plug's okay, and then I'm gonna put the number two coil here on number six, and number six on number two. And if the misfire moves to number two, then we'll know it's just an ignition coil. It's as simple as that when you only have one misfire for one cylinder. If you finally get the spark plug ignition coil off, you'll see they have weird spark plugs. Typical BMW crap. You see, they're not regular hex heads, they got these crenulations. But fortunately, if you have a 14 millimeter socket, it does fit over it. You do not have to go to BMW to buy a fancy socket. A plain old 14 millimeter socket will work to get it off. Of course, a crenulated one works better, but here's a plain old regular hex one. You wiggle it, it goes right on. It'll hold it and take it off. You don't have to buy that special tool. But you gotta have a 14 millimeter thin wall deep socket and you'll never get the stupid thing out. It's not a regular size spark plug. Now with a ton of wiggling and prying and then wiggling to get it off because of course there's no working room in the back of the engine. Out comes the stupid number six ignition coil. There it is. Now of course it could be a bad spark plug so I'm going to take that spark plug out and put a new one in just in case. Now even that's a chore. Not much working room and I had to put three different size extensions in to get it deep enough, but it seems to be coming loose. And yes, I can turn it with my bare hands now. A lot of work. Voila, finally. And as you can see here, I had to have various wiggling extensions. So I put it in with just a short one. Now when that falls in, you put this on top so you can get the socket and get your ratchet to take it off. But then when you pull it out, it won't come out. So you gotta pull it out part way, then take off that end, then get the rest with the spark plug. Now, it doesn't look horrendous, but all the work on this, I'm not taking a chance. Maybe it's bad electrically inside, so I'm just gonna replace it with a new one. Just be sure to replace it with the same plug. These are both Bosch plugs. Now, we'll tighten the new spark plug in. No working room, of course. In this case, I'm using a stubby ratchet because there's more room for tightening up quicker. It still takes a while, but you can see the stubby one, you can turn fast. Then for the final part, use the big one. And now comes the logical part. This is the number six ignition coil. I'm gonna put that on number two, and put number two on number six. Then when we drive it, if the code goes to number two, you'll know it was the coil that caused the problem in the whole place. You don't wanna guess at these things. They're pretty expensive on BMWs. So before I forget, I'm gonna put the number six on a number two right now. In it goes. They go in a lot easier than they come out. They just plug in a hole, and then the connector just snaps in, and you lock it with the top. Then we gotta do it in the back. I can't film that, there's no room, but it's the same process. Then we use a scan tool to erase the codes. As you can see, codes remaining zero. And start it up. Just don't forget to put the air filter back on. Make sure that's all tight. Well, here goes nothing. Well, hopefully something. Now we'll take it for a spin and see what happens. Well, that didn't take long. The check engine light already come back on. So let's see what the magic computer says. And magically enough, it now says PO302, cylinder number two misfire. Hooray! We didn't fix it yet, but now we know it's the ignition coil. Because we put the number six ignition coil on a number two, and the misfire moved from number six to number two. So we know that coil's bad. We'll go put a coil in it. So we get the brand new coil on. Swap out number two again. So this time we'll just move this out of the way a little. Unplug it. Out it comes. And here goes the new one. Back in the hole. Uh, plug it in. Make sure it's lined up right and snap it in place. There we go. Put the stupid bolts back on. Ridiculous covers. I don't know why they even bother. And this time we should have better luck. Sounds a lot better already. No more of that backfiring. 
Well, we gotta take it for a road test anyway. And as you can see now, it's idling smooth, but watch, when you step on the gas, it goes. No more hesitation. So the next time your BMW or any other car starts misfiring, now you know how you can fix it yourself. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.